My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... But I really want to learn. So... Every week on this show, a classical music expert will give me a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the classical classroom. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the classical classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and here with me is Todd Reynolds, who is a violinist, composer, educator, technologist, and he has been the violinist of choice for composers like Steve Reich, Meredith Monk, uh, the group Bang on a Can. He's also, um, he founded the string quartet Ethel, and he was an early member of the Silk Road Ensemble. Apparently he doesn't really believe in genres very much, so I'm not sure what we're going to be talking about today as it relates to classical music, but I kind of don't care. I'm interested. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Daisha. How are you? I'm nice. good. It's lovely to be here. So um, what are you going to be teaching me about today? We're going to be talking about, uh, since, your, since your show is really pointed toward classical music, I thought it might be really interesting to talk about what that term really means, right? In its sort of yeah. breadth and its depth. Yeah. A lot of people still in this day and age, when they think of classical music, they think of Beethoven and Tchaikovsky and all the old composers. But sometimes they don't even make it to the new composers. Like, like, like they don't make it past Stravinsky and Bartok and Debussy and Ravel. Some, some people still don't think of classical music in its really current form. Mm-hmm. And I've spent my life in that realm, classical music as it occurs today. Yeah. And one of the interesting things about it, especially as time passes, even since I started in the business 25 years ago, is the actual term genre is just being over and over redefined in even into non-existence. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm, I'm often referred to as genre busting or genre ignoring or genre defying. Mm-hmm. And in fact, that's infuriating because it is a label in itself. And, you know, so <laughs> right. it's like uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about what classical music means and how we label things. I'm really excited about that because just like the classical music actually referred to the classical era. Like there, there's like the romantic era and the classical era and the blah, blah, blah era. Mm -hmm. And uh, see how much I've learned. Yeah. Um, I feel like classical is used like people use the word tissue or coke to refer to like, it's, yeah, you know. it's, it, it, I mean, it's sorry, essentially Kleenex branding, and, right? Yeah, 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 it's essentially that that you know. What do you think of when you think about coffee? You know, exactly. it's become Starbucks. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's that that's sort of what it what it's become. For for me, it's really important to look a little bit past that. The term classical, I sort of redid my whole thinking in terms of labeling mm-hmm. a long time ago, because I play music that is either happening right now, which I make up on the spot in front of you without any notes in front of me, or whether it's a composer who's just written something for me, Uh I begin to think of all music past two years ago as classic music, right? So Black Dog from Led Zeppelin Mm -hmm. is the same to me as a Beethoven symphony. It Mm. exists for me in the Mm. same realm. You and I are going to get along so well. Oh, good, good. (laughs) Yeah, I... I, I, I think that's a much more powerful way to think about music. Human beings need to label things. We are meaning-making machines. Yeah. That's sort of what we do. We have language mm-hmm. to the point that it both enriches our lives and debilitates us. Yes. Right? So yeah. reframing the labels has been really helpful for mm-hmm. me in that way. Early on, after I got out of school, I began to realize that genre itself you know, the classical side, the jazz side, the, I, I sort of dabbled in it all. I really mm-hmm. extended past what I knew to investigate new things, but I never mastered any of them because I didn't devote a lifetime to them. <laughs> right? right. Yeah. But yet the spirit of that music infiltrates the music that I make and who I have become. Yeah. I love the idea of not just the cross pollination of genres, like I think thinking about things in that way kind of points to uh, a separateness that really isn't there. 
Hmm. Well, it, yeah, but it's, I think it's also important to think of like who we are, what ages we are, where we're coming from, what's sort of what, what we're inundated with now, what's different for us. Mm-hmm. Somebody 20 years older than us wouldn't really be able to latch on to that mm-hmm. because of technology and so on. We are moving fairly quickly at adapting and evolving our ways of thought about this. Yeah. I'm I'm here to talk about it because I believe in it just as much as you do. Mm-hmm. So I'm really excited to, whenever I am I'm given the opportunity to, to share that idea of looking at it differently. Mm-hmm. But it actually started in 1960. Dun dun dun. Yeah, right. With what? Well, what happened? Back then, John Cage changed the way we think about music, just like Marcel Duchamp changed mm-hmm. the way we think about art. Yeah. Uh, in the John Cage realm. Uh, of course, many people know about the piece 4 minutes and 33 seconds. Fun fact, John Cage's 4 minutes and 33 seconds is often thought to be 4 minutes and 33 seconds of silence. Actually, it's a composed piece where John Cage had a pianist come out and sit down at the piano and do nothing. And the noise that happened in the room during that 4 minutes and 33 seconds is the piece. Right. So that sort of changed the world. Mm -hmm. And John Cage's aesthetic, especially as uh, put forward in his book, Silence, is that music is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And every sound that is made and every sound that occurs in nature and outside of nature and by machine, all these things are part of our landscape and can be considered music. Yeah. And so, so because of John Cage, we began to think about music differently. You know, and that was, that's a pretty big deal. I don't know. I don't know when everybody really got what what that did, but mm-hmm. you know that the minimalists who, who were Terry Riley, uh, Lamont Young, Steve Reich, Philip Glass, mm-hmm. and then later John Adams, and you know that the, the minimalists had a real strong aesthetic, which in a way comes out of Cage, but not in that sort of abstract throw some coins, consult the I Ching because that's the most organic thing you can get type of way. Right. But more so that the minimalists were concerned with sort of removing emotion from music and getting down to the materials. Yeah. Right? Composing with cells of material, composing with very, very finite small amounts of material. Of course, that's that's sort of the, the, the lineage that I attached myself to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was very fortunate early in my career in New York to be, become part of Steve Reich's ensemble. And um, and I traveled with him for many years. We haven't we haven't played as an ensemble uh, for a while, but we'll be in I think in Carnegie Hall in uh, on September 11th playing his his uh, latest string quartet. Very cool. So in being with him and playing that music, it resonated so strongly with me. And you know, it used to be back in the day when those guys first started out, there were sort of equal boo and equal applause. It wasn't it wasn't just you know. <laughs> graciously accepted by the concert hall audience, right? right? Because there was this thing happening that was really went against what people uh, were calling classical music, yeah. right? Yeah. So so this is part of our conversation. It's like John Cage thought of as a classical new music composer. Yeah. Perhaps even more of a philosopher than a composer, although he, <laughs> although he wrote much music and is a wonderful composer. But he changed the way we thought about it. Then the minimalists, and they had their own thought, but... But, but Steve Reich was grabbing music from, from Indonesian gamelan, from African airway drumming. These, these influences, Terry Riley, Indian music, you know, all of these influences began to sort of come together inside of what they knew to be classical music. And then there's this next sort of form of classical music born. I mean, of course, we've skipped all the serialists and 12 tone and so on. But, but, it, but it may be a good time, actually, to listen to some music and to say, okay, is this classical music? Like, for instance, <laughs> if, it, if you listen to this piece by, uh, by Milton Babbitt, which is completely serialized, formalized, it's mathematical, it's put together without any emotion or thought for traditional phrasing, mm-hmm. but is that classical music? Well, most certainly it is. He's one of our most revered classical composers. And he's, he's part of that stream, right? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but there's that music. And then there's this music 
from Steve Reich, music for 18 musicians, this huge hour-long spectacle of percussion and piano and, and strings on stage. move around and and it's the most in a way sane kind of music but evolving in such a way that you're entirely engaged and by the time you you reach the pinnacle at you know an hour later you really do feel like 20 minutes has passed at the very most it's an amazing it's an amazing uh, piece to listen to you know it sounds it sounds very repetitive in a way at the beginning but you soon figure out it's not This is an experience. It also, <laughs> it's funny, not not to uh, make it too utilitarian, but this is the perfect hour-long elliptical machine workout. <laughs> Truly, because like I said, 20 minutes appears to have passed. I'm gonna try this while I'm running. So that's happy. it. That's it. It's great. It's I feel great. like I might get hypnotized. It's very like, right. You know. It's it's funny because I very early on, and I I mean I I attribute a lot of my musical influence in my own music. To, to Steve Reich. Mm -hmm. And part of it is because it's got this motor to it. Yeah. And I love the, uh, the feeling of travel. I love the train thing. I love the car thing. You know, it's like when people ask me about my own record, Outerboro, I say, put on the first record, which is all my music, and drive. Mm -hmm. Because it's really great driving music. And... Uh, it's mostly because uh, that sort of idea of forward, forward motion mm -hmm. and just... Momentum. And inevitability, you yeah. know? Inevitability, but then wonder because you don't really know what's coming next. Yeah. But it's sort of like, like riding a train or riding in a car or on a bike and really just watching the landscape. Yeah, that's change. It's very you. It's of the moment, of the present, as you might right, say. Right, right. And whereas, uh, you know, your traditional... I guess what people would think of as traditional classical music, there are very distinct parts. And when a composer makes some sort of change, they develop something really important, it's inevitably because they have changed this expected component of a symphony or, or something like that, and they've done it differently, and the audience is... They're not hearing what they expect. And inevitably, when people first hear it, they're like, What? This portion of the music is missing. It's different. It hasn't ended in the way that it's supposed to. We don't even know if we're supposed to applaud yet. I do think that in all music, and I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it, it's like what, what makes all experience really engaging? Mm -hmm. Outside of music, too. It's like, why do I love comedy? Why do I love Louis C.K.? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Part of it is because he's speaking the truth that nobody else is going to risk saying. But the other thing is, is there's that twist and that turn. The unexpected. Right, exactly. Yeah. And what I, what I love to refer back to in theater and movies as status change, mm -hmm. right? Status shift. And that's, that's what I think, for me at least, is the core of what keeps me engaged in any art form. Mm -hmm. You know, finding out something that I didn't know before, a little bit of knowledge, or a little something new, something that surprises me. It's the surprise. It's the magic trick. It's the, it's, it, it's the reveal, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, of course, that's the basis of all Mozart and Beethoven. It's just, it's all there. That's what's so fascinating about studying classical music is to think, you know, the stuff that we hear at the time... It was blowing people's minds. I mean, it was, you know, this was brand new 
stuff, and these people laid the groundwork for things like what we just heard. Right. Like right. Absolutely. That, that li- well, let's talk about that line a little bit, like, and the the what the classical period was. What the tell me about the periods. I I actually I love that the Baroque and the Romantic period and everything, all that exists, and we will be referred to as some period Mm -hmm. at some point. I think we're moving too quickly to have that be codified very easily, which is a good thing. So if we talk about classical music, I think one of the reasons that everything gets lumped into classical music is because, um, I mean, even in new music, I often think that it's like anything with a larger scale form, anything that comes out of academia, Anything that has sort of an intellectual formalized bent to it yeah. is thought of as more serious or more classical, right? Yeah. On the other hand, these days, if you take myself, I am a classical musician by my very essence, by my heritage. I've been playing the violin in a classical environment for 46 years. So that's what I do. I play the violin. It's mostly known as a, it's either known as a classical instrument or as a folk instrument, Mm -hmm. right? For me, it's both, thankfully. Um, And it doesn't, these distinctions don't exist. But, uh, but I'm, so the music that I make gets filed in the classical bin, even though we don't have bins anymore either. And Tower Records is gone. Oh, so know, right, it makes me so, so it's sad. like you know on the iTunes you'll find it under classical most likely uh-huh. you know. I know that there is a contingent of people out there that feel that it's important to maintain this sort of purity in in classical music, that it shouldn't become this thing that you're that you're talking about this this new sort of hybrid thing, do you think that there is a danger of this music being lost or watered down because genres are colliding and mixing? No. Okay. No. This is a worry and a concern that has been with every generation. Mm -hmm. You know, these kids today... (laughs) <laughs> yeah. You know, the worry that that you know, we are we are going to pot in America because we lost the values of the 50s. Mhm. To hell in a hand in a handbasket. Hand That's it. <laughs> so it's like we're all in a handbasket anyway, so let's get along. Yeah. Here here's what I think is important. And this is true across <laughs> this is true across politics, across religion, across all culture. You need to maintain history while writing it. If you're writing history, and curators do this too, they write history by who they present, right? Mm. So art curators, music curators are bringing people to bear, right? So it's like history is getting written by the people who come to the fore and are celebrated and given opportunity to offer up their art, right? So that's going to happen no matter what. You do not close the institutions. You do not stop the education. And the funding needs to go across the board to to both old music and new music. I, I don't think either of those things live without the other. Mm-hmm. So I'm not afraid that anything is going to get watered down because humans have a proclivity to organize, to manage, to discipline, to be very academic, to use their smarts also to use their hearts. And I think there's always a balance that's going on and a renegotiation of where that, where that stuff lives in the culture. Yeah. So there's always going to be a rubber band effect. I teach at two schools in New York, uh, the Manhattan School of Music and Manus at the New School. And it's funny, as, as I see the students come in, a lot of them come in with a real academic intellectual idea still of like, you know, the only stuff with any relevance to play, what I really want to perform is the stuff that's difficult, is the stuff that's really very high, highbrow. Western European avant-garde court sort of composers, they're like really into that. Yeah. And then you'll have a few that are coming in with this sort of blend of like, you know, pop and folk and everything else and, and that. And, but there's a lot of intellectual sort of demand, intellectual rigor that the students bring with them, that they're demanding of themselves and that the professors still demand of them. Nothing's getting lost. Yeah. We're fine. Yeah. I think that's what makes this kind of music 
a little different than, say, I don't want to put anybody down, but Taylor Swift. I feel like a five-year-old could write the hook for some of her songs. And that doesn't mean that it's not fun to listen to, but it's I'm an interesting sure thing. It, it's yeah. an interesting thing because it, it's funny. Even listening to you talk right now, you had sort of a a time of of negotiating how you wanted <laughs> yeah. to say that. There's this there's this pressure on us, right, to evaluate uh-huh. this in this way. Yeah. Do you know no five year old can write a hook? <laughs> not a Taylor <laughs> totally Swift hook. Not a Pharrell Williams hook. Yeah. Not. It's like you know, happy is like. If I listen to that tune, there's a reason that tune is on a 24-hour video loop. Mm -hmm. Because I could listen to it for 24 hours. It's sick. Mm -hmm. But the thing is so hooky. Yeah. He's like one of the most brilliant musicians ever because of that. But I think that that there are all all sorts of other ways to talk about this music in terms of um, simplicity. Yeah. Right? Without it being pejorative. Simplicity and complexity. If you take a take a listen to a Steve Reich tune, it's very simple material. Take a like a listen to a Taylor Swift song or, or or Pharrell, you know, there's something that's very hooky about it. There's something that repeats and just works, you know, and repeats over and over and over in a way that is simple. That is very hard to not have be boring. Mm-hmm. And it's the producer's job to have that hook not sound stupid or boring. Right. Those people could make Twinkle Twinkle Little Star hip. Mm-hmm. And so that's not what we call classical music. In 20 years, it'll be classic music, though. Yeah. It'll be something that we remember and something that made a difference during this time, but may not be so relevant to the culture then. Hmm. And in that way, all the music that gets made has, has its place in the world. Mm-hmm. Has its place in society. Yeah, I I um, <laughs> I can't remember what I was reading, but it was some blog online, and somebody said, "Remember when somebody told you that it was okay to like Prince, and then you ble- breathe a sigh of relief?" <laughs> I was like, "Oh my god!" That's... <laughs> because I had that moment. Everybody had that. I moment. had that moment, and 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 one of the yeah. most seminal experiences of my whole musical lifetime was seeing Prince in New Jersey, and it changed my life. Again, I'm like 48 years old, and it changed, Prince changed my life. What's that? Yeah, and there's a certain relaxing that came with it. And I think that, I mean, that's a hilarious comment, and and I love that that's so universal. (laughs) It's so true. It is so true. But But then say that to a symphony orchestra player uh who looks at you and says, who's Prince? (laughs) <laughs> right, and I and I think thankfully there are far less of those guys, yeah, you know, going around the the the, the people who aren't acquainted with more of the culture. Mm-hmm. You know, that's why I had uh, I've had a few experiences with students. You know, where where they're they have this heavy intellectual bent, and and then I then I walk in and they're listening to Katy Perry when I enter <laughs> the classroom, and I'm like. D- do, do you realize that these two things that you're listening to actually go together? And this doesn't, you know, people right. often ask me, what are your guilty pleasures? And I'm like, I have none. Right. I'm out about it all. Yeah. I think things are becoming more fluid. Same same thing with sexuality, you mm-hmm. know? It's like things are much more fluid now. We don't have to to only identify one way or the other. It's like, you know, let's let's let let's let this become a little bit of a broader issue. I think mm-hmm. that's that's what we need to do in music too. Kinsey scale. I think the genre itself, we in fact I was on a conference panel at the Ringling Museum in Sarasota, Florida very recently with my good colleague uh, Luke Dubois, who's a video artist, and he had written a paper and this conference was on that paper, yes he has a big exhibit down there, um, called Genre Creates Ghetto. And it's very interesting when you talk, even as you were talking now about the, there's this pressure to sort of acknowledge genre and do this. When you get the people who are in power or doing the writing or whatever, you know, really, really pinning down a genre, it creates a real narrowness where where you can't escape it. And mm-hmm. it's sort of a, po- it's an induced poverty art- artistically inside of that because you don't get to open up to the richness. You don't get to have... You know, <laughs> like access that. and permission to love Prince, for instance. Yeah. You know, you, you, you end up sort of culturally impoverished 
when you get so narrow. I like induced poverty. Yeah. That that's a fantastic it's, way to put it. Uh, so so I so I think that that we the people who are who are here either performing, writing, listening, enjoying, supporting the music, you know, I I love to preach the idea that 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 we open up past that. Mm-hmm. And we and we don't, you know, you know, classical music is a term that we sort of all understand mutually in, yeah. in, in the same way. But I do not want that to ever stop people from being able to listen to something else yeah. and recognize its wonder. And, and I was brought up that way. I was brought up yeah. that way, both both musically and religiously, black, white. Sure. And I think a lot of these lines are blurring. It's a big ass world out there. Tends to be. Before we close our conversation, tell me where you think classical music is sort of headed next. What do you think the next step is? Where are you going next? Oh, God, I can't even answer that question. Where am I going next? Where am I going <laughs> it seems next? Maybe that's a great answer. I'm, I'm, <laughs> have I'm, no idea. I'm going back to New York. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of music right now that sort of crosses, just really, really treads that line. And if you take like Nico Muley, Shara Warden, my, my brightest diamond, you take some of these these people sort of who are in the same world, mm-hmm. this music comes, and I think beautifully so, so much out of our culture today. You've mm-hmm. got all these people who are inhabiting both pop music and classical music simultaneously yeah. and living there comfortably. And that music is, uh, is I think, what the present of classical music is. Where we go then, who knows? But there's so much uh, talent to be mined there over the next years. I'm excited about it, like, because I, I really just personally connect with it a little more. That's cool. Because there's just so much new stuff out there. And there's this loveliness about having the world expand out. So the music is developing. Yeah. I you like know what's that. not developing as fast is education. Oh god. And and yeah. that's that I guess is is the one thing that I'm that I'm super concerned about. We need to find a way to have the old and the new with like sort of equal weight. It's it's like it's like a double education, you know? Yeah. How do you do that? Because I'd like that to happen. I would like every student that comes into school to end up coming out of school as an electronic musician, an improviser, and a composer. And you know who that model is? That's Johann Sebastian Bach. Who was the improviser, the composer, and the electronic musician. No electricity, but an organ is as close as you can come. <laughs> smart guy, this Bach. Oh, smart From guy. what I hear. Yeah, what was it, 35 or 40 minutes he had to write for church every Sunday? Right. You know, yeah. something like that. I'm not sure. Well, because I am about to freeze to death, I'm going to stop our conversation. Because you can tell that I could that, that I could go on for four hours with you. <laughs> no, and I could talk to you for four hours, too, <laughs> except for the fact that I can no longer feel my face. <laughs> <laughs> Todd Reynolds, thank you so much for coming on to the Classical Classroom. This has been a really engaging conversation. I seriously could keep it going for a long time. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a total pleasure. Before we go, we need to tell people where they can find your very cool music. You can find my music pretty much in all the regular channels, iTunes, Amazon. You can find my record, which is called Outerboro. Uh, you can also find that and more at uh, music.toddreynolds.com, which is a Bandcamp uh, site. And uh, you can always follow me as Digifiddler on Twitter and through the normal Google Plus and Facebook channels as well. Cool. Everybody, if you would like to find out more about the Classical Classroom, just go to houstonpublicmedia.org backslash classroom. You can listen to us on iTunes or on SoundCloud. In fact, we have our very own SoundCloud page, soundcloud.com backslash classical classroom. If you'd like to send me an email because you have a question or because you want to tell me about your poodle, I don't know. Declay at houstonpublicmedia.org is the address. Uh, Thanks to our producer, Todd Hulslander, for twiddling knobs and for putting together a classical classroom set up in a TV studio. I'm kind of amazed at all of the wires that I'm looking at right now. 
to our program director, Sinjin Flynn, for his spiritual guidance, to me for saying words, to Todd Reynolds again for being here, and to you for listening. Thanks. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>